Okay, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you, Francois, for this introduction. Uh, hi, everyone, and uh, welcome to this uh, session uh, dedicated to uh, uh, optimal transport for uh, machine learning. Um, so, as you will see, uh, optimal transport is a is a very old theory uh, that has been created in uh, by the French mathematician uh, Gaspar Monge in uh, 1781. So, it's a very old theory. But um, optimal transport has received a, a tremendous interest from the machine learning community during the past decade. So basically, um, optimal transport uh, provides um, a very natural geometry uh, for uh, comparing probability measures. Uh, so that's why during this lecture, I will mainly talk about how to compare statistical distributions, um, how to put a distance in the space of uh, probability measures and how to move, how to align two distributions, how to move one distribution on the top of, a, of another. So uh, I'm aware that said like that, um, it can sound a bit uh, abstract, let's say, but if you, if you take a, a, step, uh, a step back, uh, it is worth noting that uh, uh, the work you are doing for most of you uh, is often manipulating probability distributions and uh, at least uh, empirical measures of, of something. So, so if you are not very convinced by this claim, let, let's take some examples. Uh, in image processing, for instance, uh, if you want to compare uh, two uh, color images, uh, one way to do this is to uh, project uh, each image in the RGB space, in the space of uh, colors, and now one image is represented by a, by a set of points, a cloud of points in this RGB space. And now comparing two images boils down to computing a distance or a divergence between uh, these two 3D empirical distributions. A second illustration comes from genomics, uh, where, for example, when you you can take, for example, a piece of uh, a human tissue and uh, uh, you want to understand the, the dynamics uh, at, the, at the cell level. So what you can do at time uh, t equals zero, uh, you can take a, a bunch of, of cells and thanks to uh, one of the recent uh, technological revolutions, uh, what you can do is to isolate a cell and uh, to get to encode this cell in the form of a numerical feature vector. And this is possible with uh, a single cell genomics, which take it, the cell and analyze this cell in the form of a large feature vector, which encodes in some way, I, I won't enter into details, but, uh, and by the way, I'm not expert, um, which encodes the genome or the transcriptome. So what you can, you can do now, you, you take your bunch of cells represented by your numerical features, and now what you get is a cloud of cells, let's say, in a numerical uh, feature space. And now what you can do, let's say six hours later, you can take again a new, uh, uh, a new set of cells and you encode them in the form of feature vectors and you get a new, a new uh, data set. And now what you want to do for analyzing the dynamics at the cell level, what you want to do is to align. You want to align those two empirical distributions and uh, uh, compute the distance between uh, those, two, those two sets. A third example comes from brain imaging. If, for example, you, you present a stimulus, an image, for instance, to a person, to a patient, what you get is, uh, is empirical data uh, in the form of the area uh, in the cortex, in the brain, uh, that was lit up, right? And you can change the stimulus and present a new image to the same person, and you get a second activation map. And what you want to do is to compare, for example, the two brain activation maps. And once again, what you have to do is to compute a distance or a divergence between those two empirical distributions. Another example comes from NLP, natural language processing. Uh, 
One of the recent uh, um, uh, trends, let's say, in, in NLP, when you want to compare the semantics of two texts, is to, after having removed the, the so-called stop words, what you want to do is to project the data in a so-called word embedding space that preserves the semantics. And this is possible, for example, with uh, word to vec I, I, I guess that some of you are familiar with this algorithm, which learns a good word embedding space where the semantic of the two uh, texts are preserved. And it takes the form of, once again, two set of points, two set of points in a, a word embedding space. And now what you want to do is to align those two clouds of points to uh, measure uh, the similarity between uh, the two texts from a semantical uh, perspective. The last example, I want to show you, it comes from deep learning. Uh, we, uh, Charlotte uh, introduced uh, very quickly yesterday, what is a, a, a generative models and the generative adversarial networks. Christian will come back to this uh, uh, Thursday afternoon. Basically the idea is the following. You have a data set, uh, a discrete set of examples. So it's a, it's a discrete uh, a distribution of points. And the objective is to learn the parameters of a, a generative model, uh, which is which takes the form of a continuous uh, distribution, and what you want is to with this uh, generative model to uh, simulate to generate synthetic data, fake data that are very similar to the real ones, and to be good, uh, what we do, uh, we try to minimize the distance, uh, the divergence between these continuous and these discrete. Uh, distributions and once again we need a distance for comparing uh, probability measures. So with all these examples, uh, what is interesting to note is that they they share the same uh, uh, main objectives. They they aim at answering the following questions: Is it if we have a, a first distribution mu and the second one mu? Uh, the the first question is how can we calculate uh, a distance? Uh, in the space of probability measures between mu and mu. Uh, how to move uh, one distribution on the top of the second one, right? How to align those two distributions, mu and mu. And sometimes uh, we, we might be interested in generating uh, um, a sort of mean, a barycenter of two probability uh, measures. And we want this interpolation between mu and mu to be to preserve the geometry of the original uh, distributions. So it turns out that in the literature, and I guess that you are very familiar with those uh, uh, with those notion, um, there exists uh, many distances and divergences that uh, allow you to compare two probability measures. Among them, uh, we can use the L1 and L2 norm, obviously, uh, which are related to the Manhattan and uh, Euclidean distance, respectively. Yevgen said a few words this morning about the KL divergence, the kullback labor divergence. So we have a bunch of distances and divergences that allow us to uh, measure, uh, 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 to compare two probability measures. But from a geometry point of view, I'm going to show you with two illustrations that these standard distances are not well suited to address these uh, these questions. So the first illustration I would like to to show you is um, is in the form of the interpolation between two distributions. So on this slide, I have a first distribution mu, a second one mu, and what I want to do is to compute like a mean between the two. What is the mean in terms of probability measures between those two distributions? And uh, this mean will be calculated like this is a is a convex combination of the two distribution mu and mu. And I'm going to 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 change the value of alpha and to check what happens when when alpha uh, uh, evolves. And on this animation, I'm going to show you uh, the behavior of the L2 interpolation. So uh, let's say an Euclidean uh, using an Euclidean distance, and it's the same as that of the fullback Leiber divergence. So what happens when you compute uh, an interpolation between the two, you get something like this. So the blue area for a given coefficient uh, 
0.6. The what you observe is that the resulting interpolation, which is the blue area here, um, is something which definitely doesn't preserve the original shape of the distributions. Because as you can notice on this slide, both mu and nu uh, have only one mode, only one peak of densities, right? And it turns out that the resulting very center is composed of two modes, right? So it doesn't preserve from a, a, a geometry perspective the original shape, the underlying structure of uh, the, uh, the, the distributions. And you have a second example here. Okay, where we new and new are very, very similar. So, so our intuition is that the Barry Santos should be uh, a, a very similar too, but it turns out that the mean of the two is some is something very weird with four uh four peaks of density uh um which doesn't preserve uh, the original structure of the of the distributions. So what we would like to get is something uh, like this. So we would like to get the distance. I come back to you. Okay. We would like to get the distance. Let's say, let's call it W, which preserves the geometry of the parameters. And we would get something like this. Okay. Something which is very similar to both mu and nu, and which would, according to the value of alpha, would slightly slide along the X axis. And on the right, on the same example as before, we would get something like this, which is very similar. It's a, very, it's a real from a, once again, from a geometric uh, uh, point of view, it's something which is very similar as a mean uh, uh, to mu and, and mu. This is our objective. We would like to get something like this in the space of probability measures. So it turns out that the standard distances do not satisfy uh, the, this requirement. The second limitation of the classic distances illustrated on this slide. So here, uh, I have two distribution mu and nu. Mu uh, uh, won't, won't, won't move in my animation, he will stay there, and nu will move along the x-axis from the left to the right, right? And for each position, for each change of mu, I'm going to compute the L1 norm, so the Manhattan distance, and the L2 norm, the Euclidean distance. And this is what happens. We get something very, let's say, weird, because uh, when the overlapping support between the two distribution is uh, not empty, right, uh, the distance is increasing, right, because mu is moving away from mu. But once the overlapping support is empty, as you can notice from this point, both distances are constant, right? While actually mu is moving far away. So the distances do not characterize well what, 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 what is happening in the space of probability measures, right? So what we, what we would like to get on the right is something like this, a distance which would increase and keeps increasing while mu is moving uh, uh, away, far away from, from mu, right? So once again, the standard distances are not well suited to, to characterize well what is happening in the, in, the, in the space of probability measures. The second, uh, the consequence of this phenomenon that happens there is that let's suppose that we want to use a distance as a loss function in a machine learning algorithm. You remember that yesterday I explained that I have a loss function which depends on parameters and if the loss is hopefully convex, we have to compute the partial derivatives with respect to the parameters we are looking for. And it turns, and, and this gives the derivative, if theta is a feature vector, we get a gradient, right? And it turns out that when the distance is constant, the gradient is zero. So if we use a gradient descent algorithm, you do understand, I introduced yesterday this, this way to learn, 
uh, you don't know in which direction you have to go because the gradient is zero. And this is a, a, a key problem was, uh, we suffer sometimes in machine learning, the notion of vanishing gradients, right? And this is exactly what happens here uh, when the, the, the loss is, is, is constant. And this doesn't happen on this slide. So this is what would, would, we would like to, to get in practice. So now you understand why, uh, you understand my claim. Uh, I claim that there is a need, a real need in machine learning for a geometric theory that would allow us to compare probability measures first. And we would like to get a distance, to put a distance in the space of probability measures. And it turns out that this is exactly the goal of the theory of optimal transport, which comes uh, for free, as you will see, with a, a distance, the so-called Wasserstein distance, which allows us to have the, 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 the main properties uh, I, I showed you before in the previous slides, and uh, which can be used very efficiently in many, many applications, uh, including machine learning and artificial intelligence. So, uh, optimal transport has been built uh, um, on the success of many people uh, during the last centuries. And uh, among them, uh, I show you just to cite some of them on the side, uh, uh, four, uh, four people, obviously Gaspar Monge, uh, who, as I told you in the introduction, introduced uh, the, problem, the problem of optimal transport in, in 1781. I will come back to this original problem right after. Then it took time, um, many years, uh, to make progress on optimal transport. I will explain why. Uh, uh, until uh, Kantorovich uh, came to our rescue uh, in uh, 1975, Okay, and uh, Leonid Kantorovich is a uh, is a Russian, uh, a Soviet uh, mathematician and an economist, and he was awarded the Nobel Prize in, econ in econ Prize in Economics in 1975. And uh, more recently, uh, as you probably know, Cédric Villani in 2010 uh, received the Fields Medal uh, for uh, his work on optimal transport, and uh, three years ago. Uh, one of his uh, former uh, PhD students, uh, Alessio Figali, also received uh, the, Fields, the Fields Medal. Okay, so to finish this introduction, uh, I would like to, um, to show you the evolution uh, of the number of co-occurrences using a Google Scholar of the two uh, key words, uh, optimal transport and machine learning. And as you can see on this plot, there is an exponential growth of the number of uh, co-occurrences in the titles of the scientific papers uh, during the past decade. And with two uh, key dates, key dates uh, first in 2013, uh, Marco Couturi at the NIPS uh, uh, conference, uh, the new name is NeurIPS, uh, Marco Couturi uh, presented uh, uh, a very efficient way to solve uh, the optimal transport problem uh, using, uh, as you will see, uh, a Syncon algorithm. And in 2017, uh, Arzhovsky and uh, his colleagues at the ICML conferences, a conference uh, presented the, the first generative adversarial networks uh, making use of the Wasserstein distance, so inclu including uh, inserting the optimal transport uh, while uh, learning a generative adversarial uh, network. Okay. So, um, this is uh, the outline of my lecture. Uh, first, I will uh, present the original uh, uh, problem uh, introduced by Monge in 1781. Then, as I said, it took uh, uh, many years uh, to make progress on this topic uh, until uh, uh, 1942, when uh, Kantorovich uh, proposed to relax uh, the original Monge pro problem and uh, using, as you will see, uh, uh, something much cheaper and uh, uh, leading to uh, the definition of the uh, Wasserstein distance. Uh, 
then I will uh, present the more the most technical part of this lecture. I will explain uh, how to solve from a from an optimization perspective the optimal transport problem. And I will show you that it's possible to get a much cheaper problem by using a uh, regularization, as I explained uh, yesterday. Uh, injecting a regularization can solve many problems in, uh, in machine learning. Um, I will also present two extensions of the Wasserstein distance, the Gromov Wasserstein distance and the fused Gromov Wasserstein distance. The first one aims at uh, allows us to compare two probability measures that can lie in two different feature space, spaces. And in the second one, the, the second one, the fuse gromov wasserstein distance, uh, allows us to uh, compare uh, uh, structured data, uh, like graphs. And it's very useful when you want to take into account not only the, the values of the features, but also the structure of the object, like, like in graphs. And then I will come back to the, to the application uh, introduced um, in my in my in the introduction presented in the introduction just to confirm that you understood what to, uh, we have done during this lecture and to convince you that optimal transport is can be very very efficient. Okay, so in in 1781, Gaspard Monge, French mathematician, uh, published published uh, le mémoire sur la théorie des déblais et des remblais. So, if you are not a French speaker, uh, the first sentence means when one has to bring earth from one place to another. Uh, so, basically, uh, Gaspard Monge asked himself the following question Is it how to take earth from one place and uh, move it, put it in another location in a very efficient way, in an optimal way? This is uh, the original uh, uh, Monge problem. So to illustrate this uh, this uh, this notion, uh, let's suppose that I have uh, a first distribution mu, which takes the form of uh, a pile of earth, a pile of uh, sand, right? And the work you have to do is to push uh, this pile of sand in a hole new, which takes the form of a second distribution, and you want just to fill in this hole with me. Okay, so this is the work we have to do. So, uh, if it was nowadays, uh, we, okay, we, we could use uh, a plow or a bulldozer, right? And uh, to do this work, we just have to push forward the pile of sand and fill in uh, uh, the hole, right? And that's it. So, as you can see, the notion of um, effort d doesn't really matter, right? And behind this task, uh, there is no real uh, optimization problem, right? But actually, in uh, in in 1781, uh, things was very, uh, were very different uh, without bulldozer. So, what we could do, we can take a shovel, right? And we can take uh, all the density at a given point, right? So we take the earth, the sand at a given place, and the objective is to move this earth and to send it to a given location, let's say this location Y, which is just the image of, a, of X by a given function, a transportation function, a mapping function. And once Y is found the right place to put uh, this uh, this earth, we, we can drop it, right? So this is how it works. And obviously here, the notion of efforts does matter, right? Because uh, as illustrated on this, uh, on this figure, heavy mass uh, shouldn't be transported uh, very far, right? So we have to take into account in this context, the notion of cost, the notion of effort of, uh, of transportation. So we have to take into account a function C, a cost function, which for any X gives the cost of transportation to the right destination Y, which is the, the image of X by the function T, 
right? So the work to do is just the product, the density we have to transport times the cost of transportation, right? Obviously, we have to do it for the entire density of mu. And that's why we need a function which automatically do it, does it. And this function is usually called the push forward function. And this function is the, the, the result of a minimization problem, which minimizes the integral over the entire uh, density of C times mu. Okay. And uh, this problem is a constraint optimization problem. And this notation is means that uh, basically the entire density of mu has to be moved on the top of mu, right? The entire density has to be satisfied. So this is the definition of the original launch problem, right? In the continuous uh, in the continuous case. Uh, as I explained yesterday, uh, in machine learning we we like uh, clouds of points, right? Most of the time we have discrete uh, distributions of points, right? And in this case, a uh, launch problem is, is also defined. We have a first distribution mu represented as a set of points. And uh, according to, to the importance of the point, we can have uh, 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 examples that are uh, circles that are uh, uh, more or less uh, 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 large, and uh, we have the same for the target distribution for the new distribution. And it turns out that those two sets of points can be represented by two discrete distributions, uh, distribution of Dirac's. So this example corresponds to this uh, Dirac. Okay, this example corresponds to this Dirac, right? And each point, according to its importance, is weighted by, co by a coefficient. Let's call it a, uh, AI. So now a distribution mu is defined by the weighted, uh, a weighted combination of Dirac's, right? And we have exactly the same for uh, the new distribution. So now we have two empirical measures uh, of points. And uh, the Monge problem is very similar to, to, to as uh, uh, previously defined, uh, I just replaced the, the integral by a sum, a finite sum of the cost times uh, uh, the density we have to transport. And once again, uh, the entire mass of probability has to be sent from mu to mu. To mu okay, so we have to fulfill this uh, probabilistic requirement. Okay, and if we solve the knowledge problem, it turns out that probably in this case, we will get this solution. Those two guys will be uh, sent on the top of Y1, this one on the top of Y2, and the remaining X4, X5, and X6, XX, X6, sorry, on the, on the top of Y3. Okay. It turns out that uh, the, the original formulation of, uh, of the Monge problem is, is an ill post problem. So now with the with the lecture you probably you attended yesterday, you know what is an ill post problem. We have an ill post problem when, for example, we are not there is no guarantee of the existence of a solution, and it turns out that uh, this property is not satisfied by the Monge problem because if you understood well what I've explained so far, uh, we have we our shovel we have to take the entire uh, uh, pile of earth. Uh, or, or sand at a, at a given uh, location. So, said differently, I cannot split the mass of this guy. Okay? So, in, in this Thai example, I have one example from mu, two examples of mu. Since I cannot split this density, this mass, this uh, uh, problem, uh, according to the Monge formulation, doesn't have uh, any, uh, any solution. Uh, sometimes uh, the solution is not unique. On this type example, you can see that we have two different possibilities to send the red points on the top of the blue ones, right? So then uh, we have a problem of non-uniqueness. In uh, 1988, uh, Brunier uh, proved the so-called existence theorem under some uh, conditions. Uh, if the 
POST function is the based on the L2 norm, and if mu and nu are two absolutely uh, continuous uh, distributions, in this case, uh, there exists a unique solution T, which takes the form of the gradient of a convex function, right? So under, this, under these conditions, the solution is unique, it exists and is unique. But in general, uh, this problem is not convex, right? And if you if you, you look at the, this formulation, we can see that these uh, constraints are uh, non-convex, uh, messy constraints. And if you take into account the, the integral there, uh, this uh, uh, optimization problem has a very uh, frightening looking, right? So it took many years to make progress on this on it until uh, uh, Kantorovich uh, came to uh, rescue in 1942. So Kantorovich proposed a very simple solution to address the, 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 the previous uh, 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 issue. He suggested to, uh, to allow the split of the mass of probability. So said differently, once again, this is the problem that cannot be solved with the Monge formulation. And Kantorovich suggested to allow mu to split the mass like this, and now allowing uh, us to get the solution, right? So now one X can have different images, several images Y. That's why now what we are looking for is not a transportation function, a mapping function T, a push forward function T anymore. Now, what we are looking for in the discrete case, we are looking for a coupling matrix, a joint probability a matrix, where here the rows corresponds to the examples of my uh, source distribution, the mu distribution, the columns of this uh, matrix corresponds to the examples of the target distribution, the new uh, uh, distribution, and the intersection of a row and a column is nothing more than a, a joint probability, which corresponds to the mass of this example transported at this destination, right? So now the unknown the unknowns of this uh, optimization problem take the form of uh, entries of a coupling matrix. Uh, uh, and let's call this matrix gamma. So let's take an illustration of this problem uh, on, the, on a toy example. Let's suppose that we have three bakeries, uh, one, two, and three, uh, which uh, let's say produce uh, croissant, and uh, we have three uh, hotels, A, B, and C, and uh, which, uh, which order uh, a croissant, right? So this is the production of the bakery one, and this is what is uh, ordered by hotel A. So a very naive solution to solve this problem on how to send the, the, the croissant from the bakeries to the hotels is to use proportions. Right, a very naive and stupid solution, which consists in saying 120, 19, and 90. So the proportions are 4, 3, and 3. And we multiply those uh, uh, proportions uh, by the production of each bakery. So uh, for bakery one, we have 60 croissants. So applying those proportions, we know that now we need to send 24 croissants to uh, the hotel A, 18 to hotel B, and 18 to hotel C. And the same for, for the three others, right? And I guess that you easily imagine that this solution is naive and it's very stupid because it doesn't take into account the effort to send the croissant from the bakeries to the hotels. We don't take into account the, the distances, in this case, the length of the path from the bakeries to the hotel. So that's why I said that this is a stupid, a stupid solution, right? So now this, the question is, is it possible to get a cheaper solution by considering, by taking into account 
the costs? And the answer is yes, and it will take a very simple form. So on this slide, I'm going to show you that the Kondorovich problem can be solved just by manipulating two matrices. The first matrix we, we have is the matrix of distances, which characterize, for example, this entry, the distance, the cost of transportation between the bakery one and uh, the hotel A, right? So obviously this distance metric is known in advance and, and it can be pre-computed uh, during a pre-process. Uh, we have a second uh, matrix, which is the transportation matrix, or also called the coupling matrix, right? And this corresponds to the matrix we are looking for. And once again, the rows of this matrix corresponds to uh, the examples of the mu distributions. In this case, it's the number of croissants produced by uh, the bakery uh, one, bakery two, bakery three, and the columns corresponds to the examples of the mu distribution, which corresponds to the number of croissants uh, uh, ordered by the hotel A, B, and C. So this unknown corresponds to the number of croissants that have been to be sent from bakery one to hotel B. So it's interesting because the problem is described by just by counts, okay, and, and distance, a distance matrix. So now if we replace the counts by probabilities, right? So we have exactly the same uh, matrices as before, except the fact that now those guys correspond to probabilities. So it's the, like the probability for bakery one to produce a, a croissant, right? And this is the probability for hotel A to order a croissant, right? And the intersection between the two is just the mass of probability of croissant sent from bakery one to the hotel A. All those guys correspond to the unknowns of the optimization problem, right? And it turns out that this problem can be uh, solved can be represented in the form of a very simple optimization problem. So it turns out that in the discrete case, the optimal coupling matrix, this matrix we are looking for, is the minimizer of the following optimization problem, which aims at minimizing the products between the mass and the corresponding distance. We want to send a mass of croissant from bakery one to, uh, to uh, the uh, hotel A. We have to take into account the cost of transportation between those two uh, locations, right? And it turns out this can be drastically simplified in this form. It's nothing more than the inner product, the Frobenius inner product, component wise inner product between gamma, this matrix, and the distance function, uh, the distance matrix uh, D. Keep in mind that gamma has to satisfy a constraint. Uh, once this uh, matrix has been uh, uh, um, uh, found, let's say, we have to check that the sum of these three probabilities of the first row sum up to A1, and the same for the, same for the second, for the third, and we have exactly the same condition uh, over the columns, right? So this is exactly what express uh, these uh, instructions. We have the first constraint, checking that, checking that uh, gamma, this matrix, times a vector of M1s gives A, and gamma transpose times a vector of n ones. I remind you that m and n are respectively the number of examples of the of mu and nu. And this product allows us to retrieve the marginal of p. So behind these constraints, uh, the meaning of this constraint is that the marginals are, are, uh, are kept unchanged, right? So this is uh, the Kontorovich problem. And what we can notice is that the linear, uh, the objective function is linear because it's nothing more than, than an inner product. The construct is linear in gamma, obviously. 
the constraints are also linear in gamma, right? And the linear objective function and linear constraints, we get a linear program that have the nice property of always having a solution, right? So, uh, unlike the Monge problem, we know that now that uh, the Kantorovich at least have a solution, has a solution, and at least we, we get uh, gamma, this expression, which is the product. So, this is the vector A, and this is the vector B. And uh, uh, an, admissible, uh, an admissible solution is just the product AB transpose, which corresponds to the naive solution, the stupid one I mentioned before, which doesn't take into account the distances between the two, uh, the hotels and the bakery. So, obviously, we hope uh, that we will be able to be much better, but at least this solution is admissible. Okay. So, on the previous example, uh, uh, if we run, uh, if we solve the Kantorovich problem, we get this solution, which tells us that the 60 croissant from bakery one, bakery, bakery one will are split into two subsets, 30 which uh, go to hotel A and 30 which go to hotel B, and no croissants are sent to hotel C because of the very large distance between bakery one and hotel C. Uh, what about the 90 croissants from bakery two? They are all sent to hotel A that allows Bakery three to send its production to hotel B and C, and without having to send something uh, very far uh, corresponding to hotel A. Okay, so this is basically the idea and how uh, the Kantorovich problem works. The good news is that when you solve the Kantorovich problem, you get directly a, a distance between two probability measures. And a distance for free. We, you don't have additional calculation. You get directly a distance between mu and mu. And, and this is uh, the definition of the Wasserstein distance. So the P Wasserstein distance between mu and mu is defined as a, once gamma, you have find the optimal value of gamma. The Wasserstein distance is nothing more than the inner product between your solution and the cost uh, matrix. So you have for free, you get for free a distance, uh, uh, a Wasserstein distance, which has several nice properties. So it's a distance between probability measures in the space of uh, 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 probability measures, not in this feature space. I don't know if you see the difference, but it's in the space of distributions. It satisfies all the axioms uh, of uh, natural distance. When P is set to one, you get, maybe some of you already know this distance, the earth mover distance, the EMD, which is well used in, for example, in, in, in image processing in computer vision. And as I explained before, this distance doesn't need the two overlapping support, supports to be empty. And you have now, now you understand why actually, as I presented before, while uh, uh, mu is moving far away from mu, uh, the Wasserstein distance keeps increasing, which characterizes well uh, what, what is happening in the space of probability measures. Okay. What is nice with this uh, 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 theory is that uh, since now we are working in the space of probability measures, uh, it's like uh, when you solve the the, vast of the the optimal transport problem between mu and mu, it's like having a, a, a geodesic path between the two distributions on which we can compute barycenters. But barycenters, in the barycenter take the, takes the form of a new probability measures which lies on this uh, geodesic path. So you have an illustration out uh, before how to compute this barycenter. So let's suppose that we have a set of probability measures, mu1, mu2, mu n. You want to compute the mean, the barycenter uh, of this set of distributions. It's nothing more than the sum, the weighted sum 
of the uh, Wasserstein distances between the barycenter and uh, the uh, every single uh, probability measure nu i, right? And we have, you have to solve this problem because you want to minimize the average dist Wasserstein distance between the barycenter and the probability measures. Okay, and uh, this is an illustration of a barycenter of some barycenter that can be computed uh, with uh, uh, some parameters uh, uh, k two. And you have an illustration here, a more realistic illustration. So we have three distributions. Uh, a cow, a donut, and a duck, and in between you have different barycenters between the two distributions. And as you can see, for example, here, the the duck is uh, slightly uh, uh, changing uh, into into a donut, and the same between the cow and and the duck. Okay, all those guys are actually uh, barycenters. That are computed thanks to this uh, to this definition. Okay. And once again, uh, uh, the, the the those barycenters are preserving uh, the shape, the geometry of the original uh, uh, probability measures. Um, here I just uh, play with. Uh, with the algorithm, uh, I started from a mu distribution only composed of two black rectangles, and the new distribution is the word slide, right? And you have here some of the barycenter uh, we can get between those two distributions. So it's pretty cool because you can see how the black rectangles are are changing to get to get the word slide step by step. Uh, so this is the technical part of the tutorial, and uh, what I'm going to show you is the how to solve the optimi uh, the optimal transport problem uh, from a, an optimization perspective, and how to get uh, to to get uh, to transform uh, this problem in a, in a much uh, efficient and cheaper uh, form uh, just by using a regularization. Okay, so this is what I'm going to show you now. So. This is a graphical illustration of how uh, the Kantorovich problem is solved. I remind you that uh, we have to minimize uh, the inner product between uh, gamma, uh, the coupling matrix we are looking for, and uh, the matrix of distances D, right? And keep in mind that gamma has to fulfill uh, the requirement of uh, keeping unchanged the uh, marginal distributions. Um, since the constraints are linear, uh, this uh, set of uh, um, this feasible set, the set of admissible solutions, takes the form of a polytop, right? And it turns out that I, I don't know if you are familiar with optimization, but um, uh, basically linear program. Um, uh, looks for uh, vertices on this uh, polytop, like here. The solution is at a, at a vertex, at the corner of this uh, polytop. So the, this is the illustration of the counterweight problem. We have the matrix D. We want to minimize the inner product between gamma and D, and we get a solution that have to lie at the vertex of the polytop, right? It turns out that this formulation has three limitations. The first one is that if you slightly change the matrix of distances, just by slightly changing D, what happens since uh, a linear program looks for uh, vertices on the polytop, probably what will happen is you are going to jump from one vertex to another one. And so the, the, the solution will drastically change by slightly changing this matrix, okay? That's why we say that uh, the solution of this linear program is, is unstable. The second limitation, it's more a theoretical limitation. If you are very unlucky, the solution is not unique. If you just fall on the segment between two uh, vertices, uh, 
in theory, this can happen, but actually in practice, it's almost never happens, right? But we say that this problem is ill posed because uh, the solution is not always unique. And the third limitation of the contour of each problem is that um, even though the problem is a linear program, so it seems to be pretty simple, uh, by using a solver like a mean cost flow solver, uh, the complexity, the algorithmic complexity um, of this problem is super cubic. And this is mainly because uh, in the discrete case, we have to fill in a, a large uh, matrix with a lot of, uh, because I remind you that the size of the matrix is in, in, ter is in, in terms of the number of uh, examples of new, examples of new. You have all the corresponding constraints to satisfy that makes the problem not as uh, simple to solve. So, how to overcome those uh, these issues? And if you... Uh, if you followed what I what I said yesterday, one solution to transform a ill post problem into a well post problem, how to uh, uh, to uh, speed up uh, the resolution of uh, of an optimization problem, we just have to add uh, 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 to plug an additional term in the form of a regularization term, weighted by a coefficient lambda. Right, and I explained yesterday that this parameter called the regularization uh, parameter has to be tuned carefully by using, for example, a cross validation uh, uh, process, as I explained yesterday. So it turns out that there are several plenty of, of, of possible uh, regularizations, but in optimal transport, one of the most popular one is this one. The entropic uh, regularization, which is nothing more than the, the Shannon entropy. And the nice property of this uh, regularization is that it's a strongly convex function. And since it's a strongly convex function, now this problem is strongly convex, right? While the original one was linear. And this uh, 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 provides very nice property. Uh, to the solution because uh, the, uh, there is only one solution and the solution uh, uh, always exists. So we are uh, out uh, overcoming the, the limitation uh, mentions uh, before uh, of the, uh, the original Kantorovich uh, problem. So now I would like to say a few words about the role played by lambda. Uh, if lambda is zero, Okay, which means that actually we retrieve the original contour of each problem. You have an illustration on the right. Okay, so where lambda is zero, we have two distributions mu with two modes. Okay, and one distribution mu with one mode. And what happens? We get a very sparse solution. By sparse, I mean that there are, to, there are a lot of entries equal to zero in this uh, in this matrix. And as you can see, one point of mu is sent to one, oh, sorry. Okay. Is sent to one or, or just a few points in the, in the close neighborhood of, of one point. So that's why we say that this solution is very sparse. And if you slightly change the example of the examples of mu, uh, because of this sparsity, you can get a totally different transportation plan, uh, a coupling matrix, just by changing one or two points of mu. So this is wh why I, I'm saying that there is, a, a there is a risk of overfitting when lambda is too small and we are solving the original Kantorovich problem. What happens when we increase lambda? This is what I'm going to uh, show you now in the, in, the, in the animation. As you can see, we get smoother and smoother uh, a coupling matrix, okay, but at the limit, when lambda is very large, what happens? We get the naive solution, the product of the two marginal, the stupid solution, because what you can see is, sorry, what you can see is that the examples of mu are almost always are, uh, uh, send on the entire uh, distribution mu, okay? So said differently, with this solution uh, at the limit, when lambda is large, the notion of distance is not uh, uh, taken into account. So 
we have to find a good compromise uh, between the two sparse solution with the risk of overfitting and uh, two uh, smooth uh, solutions solution which uh, uh, doesn't take into account the notion of effort. And once again, uh, you will have to tune uh, lambda very carefully using a, a cross validation uh, process. Okay. Uh, an, another illustration of this phenomenon is uh, described on this slide. So we have the polytop uh, corresponding to the physical feasible set. Here I have the solution of the Kantorovich, the original Kantorovich problem. Here I have the solution when, uh, of the stupid uh, naive solution consisting in not taking into account the, the effort. And when you use lambda, a given lambda, you are building a ball inside the polytop, a convex ball, and the solution of this problem is given by this gamma lambda uh, uh, so point, okay, at the border of this of this pole. And uh, if you want to change the value of lambda, if you increase lambda uh, too much, you will tend to get the naive solution. And if you decrease too much, uh, uh, and if, if lambda tend to zero, you will get you are approximating uh, the original solution of the Kantorovich problem. Okay, so this is how it works. It's pretty simple to 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 understand. Okay, now uh, the last question is: uh, Is there an efficient algorithm for for solving this uh, regularized uh, optimal transport problem? And uh, the good news is that the answer is yes. So let's take this new regularized problem. Okay, and and this is. Uh, we can rewrite this problem just by uh, replacing uh, this term by, by its expression in terms of uh, uh, the examples i and, and j. And here is nothing more than the definition of the, of the entropy, right? And we still have to uh, uh, satisfy the, the constraints on the marginals. I don't know if you are familiar with uh, uh, the notion of Lagrangian. But on this example, it's pretty simple to understand. We consider the Lagrangian, which is first, we just copy paste uh, the objective function, right? And the two uh, constraints are plugged there, okay, and there. And they are weighted by a so called Lagrange multiplier, okay? So the Lagrange multipliers uh, take the form of a vector of uh, when the size of alpha is corresponds to the number of examples in the mu distribution, right? And the size of beta is a feature vector composed of n entries, where n is the number of examples of the new distribution. So we have n plus n Lagrange uh, multipliers. What we do now, we compute the derivative with respect to the parameters we are looking for, the, the probability, the entry at the row i and column j. We get, trust me, this solution, which is pretty simple. We set it to zero, and we get the solution of gamma ij, which, is, which takes a very simple form. We have a, a first a term which is a number which depends on the Lagrange multiplier of the mu distribution. We have a second number which depends on the uh, Lagrange multiplier of the new distribution and also lambda. And we have this term which can be pre-computed in advance. It's nothing more than the exponential of minus the distance between two points over uh, the lambda parameter. And by the way, for those who are familiar with the notion of kernels, this is nothing more than a kernel. Uh, it looks like a kernel, which uh, measure uh, for ij the similarity between two examples of new and new respectively. 
right? So by the way, this metrics, this uh, entry, but we can do you do it for the whole uh, uh, data set, uh, can be pre-computed in advance. So this is the solution of uh, gamma for one entry of the coupling matrix for the entire gamma. Uh, our matrix of unknown or unknowns. We have here dig of u. So dig of u is a matrix, a diagonal matrix where the element of the diagonal corresponds to the element of the feature vector u, and the same for dig of nu times the kernel, the matrix of similarities between your points of the two distribution mu and u. So now what we have to do, we know gamma, okay? Now what we have to do, we have to plug gamma in the constraints of the, pro of the optimization problem. I remind you that our two constraints are uh, described as follows. So I rewrite this constraint like that. And now I just have to replace those two gamma lambda and gamma lambda transpose by the expression I just found. I get this new expression. What is interesting is that if you multiply a diagonal matrix by a vector of ones, of M ones, I get the vector V, okay? Dig of V times one, uh, a vector of, of M ones, we get V, and the same for U. So we can simplify the notation. And the dig of U times K can be simplified in this form where this operation, uh, corresponds to uh, the uh, element-wise uh, product, right? So now we have something very simple. We can put KV and K transpose U on the right-hand side, and we get the solution of U and V, right? Which are the, 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 the parameters we are looking for, because if U and V are known, gamma is known. It turns out that this uh, system is a system of nonlinear equations, right? But this is where uh, the paper presented by Marco Couturi in 2013 uh, uh, became so popular because by using a synchron approach based on fixed point iterations, uh, we can solve this problem very efficiently. And the idea is pretty simple. Uh, you take V, okay, you initialize V to some value. Since K is known, as I, as I said, everything is known, so you can pre-compute this quantity. I remind you that A is known, it's just the marginal distribution of the mu distribution. If you initialize V to some value, you get U, right? And then you can plug U there. And once again, this is known, this is known, and you get V. And now you can alternate and repeat those two iterations, one, two, one, two, one, two, until uh, convergence. And the good news is that this algorithm uh, uh, has a, an algorithmic complexity in n log n, which is, you can, uh, uh, you can see that it's much cheaper than the super cubic uh, algorithmic complexity of the original Kantorovich problem. So just by benefiting from uh, the entropic regularization and the uh, synchron algorithm, you have, we have now an algorithm which works pretty well uh, depending on the value of n, but uh, which is a uh, uh, n log n. Okay, so if you want to play with your own data, your own images, your own signal, or whatever, and you want to compute the distance between two distribution, two empirical measures, uh, you can play with a, a pod library, pod for Python uh, optimal transport, and it's uh, it's an open source in, in Python. And you can also use OTT for optimal transport tools, uh, which uh, makes use of the JAX uh, uh, language, which is uh, uh, basically a variant of, of Java. Okay. It turns out that uh, when your data lie in a one-dimensional feature space, so you have only one feature, and this happens often in the real-world applications, uh, we can solve very efficiently the original uh, Wasserstein problem. Uh, in the discrete case, let's suppose that we have a set of points like this. This is the mu distribution. 
and we want to transport mu on the top of, of mu, okay, a set of a discrete set of points. You just have to merge all those guys and to sort all the points. And then it turns out that we can show that the optimal transport plan uh, aims at uh, moving this guy on the top of its nearest neighbor, right? So this guy will be moved on, on this one, and the same here, the same here, and the same here. And it turns out that this is the optimal, uh, this uh, optimal um, uh, transportation plan, and the corresponding uh, Wasserstein distance corresponds to the, the sum of the absolute values uh, uh, between the differences. In a few words, I would like to show you two uh, extensions of uh, the, the Wasserstein distance. First, the Cromov Wasserstein distance. In some applications, you have two distribution mu and mu, but unfortunately, mu and mu are not directly comparable because they lie in two different feature spaces. So you cannot compute the distance between two guys because actually there is no uh, distance that can be computed because you have two different set of vectors uh, of, of feature vectors, right? But what you can do, uh, you can benefit from the intra distribution pairwise distances. In mu, you can compute the distance between two examples. Even though you are in a, in a different uh, space, you can compute the distance between two examples of mu. And now, how Gromov Wasserstein works, it tries to send two examples y and y prime on the top of j and j prime, if and only if it preserves the relative distances between the two pairs of examples. So this is exactly what is illustrated, expressed by this uh, optimization problem. Y and y prime will be sent on the top of g, j and j prime if the distance between the two is, is small. And as you can see, uh, we have to solve uh, uh, a complex problem. We have a sum over four indices because actually at the same time we have, even though gamma is the same there, we have actually two uh, uh, coupling matrices uh, involved at the, at the same time. So that's why the algorithmic complexity is much larger uh, than the, the Wasserstein one. And once again, the, the constraints are, are the same. So it's very interesting when you want, once again, to compare two distributions that are in two different feature spaces. And once again, you can benefit from uh, the entropic regularization uh, to solve uh, this problem more, uh, more efficiently. The second extension is the fused Gromov Wasserstein distance. So this is very useful when you want to compare two objects that are structured, like two graphs. Let's suppose that I have a graph one and a graph two, okay? So I want to take uh, into account the features, right? So the distance between two examples, I and J of the two graphs, but at the same time, I want to uh, take into account the structure of the of the individual graphs. So I want to consider the distance within the graph. And if you understood why I explained so far, it's just a mix of the Wasserstein distance and the Gromov Wasserstein distance. And the fused Gromov Wasserstein distance take the following form. It's just, roughly speaking, a convex combination of the Wasserstein distance and the gromov wasserstein distance, right? So now, okay, alpha is a parameter you have to tune according to the application at hand, but it takes into account both the feature of the nodes and the structure of the graphs. And once again, you have to satisfy the constraints. Just to illustrate the interest of this uh, fused gromov wasserstein distance in practice, I simulate the following uh, toy example. Let's suppose that I have two objects. Mu is the letter C, and mu is the same letter with a, with a, a little rotation. So here, the C is is a structured data, right? I cannot just uh, 
uh, uh, uh, take the points and, and, and transport them in a, in a random way, right? I have to to to, to keep the, the structure unchanged. If I run the Wasserstein distance, I, I, I solve the, the standard optimal transport problem on this example. What I get is something like this, where, as you can see, so you have the source, new, you have the destination new, right? And in between you have some very centers. And what is interesting to note is that there, you can see that the algorithm cuts uh, a, a bottom part of the C and plug it uh, to the top part of the C to retrieve what what what, what he, uh, to retrieve the, the target distribution. So it's uh, from a geometrical perspective, it's totally stupid because it didn't learn the rotation. But since the Wasserstein distance only takes into account the distances, okay, it doesn't care if it ha it, it it has to to cut the, the the shape. It doesn't matter because from a distance uh, point of view, it's the cheaper way to go from new to new. And if you apply the fuse grammar Wasserstein on this problem, actually it learns in some way uh, uh, the, the, the perfect rotation without splitting uh, uh, the, the, the points of the mu distribution. Okay, so in this case, when the, when the shape, when the, when the structure of your data is very important, I suggest to use uh, the fuse gram of Wasserstein rather than the Wasserstein one. And there are plenty of, uh, of applications in the real world that can benefit from, from this distance, like when you, when you handle chemical compounds or molecules in, in when you want to model them in brain connectivity, social networks, obviously, and in many computer vision tasks when you want to, 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 to respect, to fulfill some, some structural information. Okay, to finish in uh, very quickly, uh, I would like to come back to some of the applications that I introduced uh, in, in the first part of my talk. Do remember, uh, I tried to convince you that uh, optimal transport is very efficient in genomics. Do you remember? We have two, uh, uh, two sets of cells, right? And uh, we were looking for a good alignment between uh, the cells at time t equals zero and at time t equals six. And now, with the optimal transport uh, 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 algorithm, you have both the coupling matrix and the Wasserstein distance. So now you have the tools for comparing in terms of distance the two probability measures, but you know how to go from new to, to new. And this is very interesting if you want to understand the dynamics at the, at the cell level. And if, if you are interested in this topic, there is a very, uh, uh, a uh, very uh, nice paper, uh, a recent paper, I don't remember, written uh, yeah, two years ago. Uh, do you remember? I, I, I tried to convince you that uh, we need to compute uh, uh, the distance between two uh, color images, but it, it turns out that in this domain, we use, the, we use a lot the EMD distance, the earth mover distance, when P equals one to compare to two images. Uh, I also introduced the NLP problem, natural language processing. When we encode, we project the, the words in a word embedding space. And now what we can do, we have to align those two set of points. We have to find a distance to check if the meaning of this text is very similar to the meaning of this one. And this can be done by uh, calculating the uh, two Wasserstein distance. Uh, I also explained that it can be very useful um, uh, in, um, in deep learning and in the so-called Wasserstein GANs. So it turns out I won't obviously enter into the details of this uh, uh, theorem, the so-called Kantorovich Rubinstein uh, theorem, but it turns out that thanks to this theorem, now we have the possibility to learn uh, a deep neural network which minimizes the Wasserstein distance uh, uh, between the real data and the uh, fake, uh, the generator of fake images. Just for your information, it's possible to 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 run the Wasserstein PCA, Wasserstein uh, principal common analysis. Okay, where now your points uh, are not are not points anymore. They are now. Uh, probability measures, 
and you are looking for components like in a PCA, which minimizes the distance between those probability measures and the very center of this set of uh, uh, probability distribution. So it's a, a variant of the standard PCA. And the last example I would like to show you, uh, uh, Yevgen Ray could only say a few words about this. Do you remember that in domain adaptation, what we want to do, we have a label data set, a source data set. We have a large number of uh, uh, target examples that are, that are not labeled, and you want to benefit from the uh, uh, model learned on the source to automatically classify the target. And, and uh, Yevgen explained uh, this morning that uh, the risk over the target is uh, bounded by the risk over the source plus a term which depends uh, uh, on the distance between the source and the target. And to be good, to be good on the target, we have to minimize the distance between the source and the target. And this is possible by using optimal transports that will align your two distributions. And then you can learn the classifier over the label source data that can be very efficient, hopefully, on the target ones. Okay, so this is the last illustration of optimal transport in machine learning. So I think it's it's over. So thank you very much for your attention and uh, do not hesitate if you have if you have questions.